Okay. I think we're going to start. Uh, we may get more people. I see the numbers that keep climbing up, but we'll start because we have a lot to cover. Um, good morning to everyone in New York City, Miami, and the East Coast. And a very early good morning to our West Coast audience as well. And a very good afternoon to those of you joining us from overseas. I see we have audience from Israel and from Spain and from Holland. Um, hello to everybody. Welcome to our State of the City panel. My name is Shlomi Ruveni, and I'm the owner of Ruveni Real Estate. We are a privately held and operated real estate brokerage in Manhattan. Our firm specializes in data analysis, design, marketing, and sales of residential new development projects. I've been involved in uh, New York City real estate for the past 34 years. And throughout that time, trust me when I tell you that I have seen the best and the worst of real estate market cycles. Um, we service the full spectrum of the new development process, usually from site acquisition through architecture and design, marketing and sell out. However, at heart, I am and always have been a salesman, a rainmaker, a broker. That's who I am, it's how I think, and it's how I work. Um, we, hosted, we hosted our first panel of the city, State of the City panel last year. It was a very informative event, straightforward, backed by analysis and facts, as well as um, smart insight from our panel of industry leaders who generously share their expertise without what I call applying any lipstick to it. Uh, applying lipstick to um, in webinars and panels I found is something that is done often today and I hope and I truly look forward to today's event and having a, a, a good, real, informative discussion with our expert panel. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to say a few words to acknowledge the hardship and sadness that our city and country have experienced recently and also to acknowledge the most vulnerable communities among us, those affected by these events the most. It seems like COVID-19 came out of nowhere like a huge tidal wave, and it is continuing in its destructive path to affect our lives in painful ways. Uh, the unimaginable loss of life in New York City and US and around the world is just heartbreaking. We hope that a vaccine is found soon so the pain is eventually stopped and we can all get back to our lives. Um, the economic meltdown which we are now experiencing is affecting many among us who are less fortunate those who are not able to cope or sustain financially. These economic hardships are not just exclusive to finances and businesses, be them be they small or large industry. They also affect our community's physical and mental health. And that's something that we should all keep in mind. And the recent events surrounding the death of George Floyd and many others have brought to the surface yet again, an ugly truth and much pain to our local and national community. On a personal note, I can say that I've learned much in the past few weeks that I did not know before or realize before a new and much needed recognition and understanding of ongoing racial inequality and systematic injustice. We at Ruveni Real Estate wholeheartedly support and stand by the black community and we support our given right to organize and peaceful, peaceful protest. Thank you for that. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists. We have an unbelievable crew here that I want to be very, that I'm very thankful uh, for joining us. Uh, we have the A team, I believe, of panelists, uh, top industry leaders. I'll start with Hall Wilkie, president of Brown Harris Stevens, a prestigious residential real estate firm in New York City with over 350 agents um, and sales to totaling in excess of $4.2 billion. Hall is a recognizable and true industry leader and a real mensch. Um, David Vaughn Spreckelson, uh, group rep president for Toll Brothers City Living in New York City. Toll City Living is a strong and highly reputable development company, which has completed over 30 condominium buildings in New York metropolitan area, and currently has a strong portfolio of projects in the city. David oversees City Living's acquisition and develop activities nationally. Edgardo de Fortuna, a brand on its own, president, CEO, and founder of Fortune International Group, a Miami-based full-service real estate firm, recognized widely through South Florida, Latin America, and Europe. Edgardo is a true visionary and a driving force in the South Florida real estate market. And of course, Jonathan Miller. Um, 
President and CEO of Miller Samuel, a real estate appraisal and consulting firm, which provides services on as much as $5 billion worth of property per year in the New York City metropolitan area. For those of you who do not know Jonathan, you need to get to know him now. He's considered by many, me including, in the industry to be the authority on New York City real estate research and valuation. So we have a very strong panel here. And let me start. Um, March 9th to the 16th represents the last normal week of business operations before COVID-19 hit and business as we knew it came to a halt. That was three months ago. Jonathan, let me start with you. Give me your take on March 2020 versus June 2020 in terms of market conditions. New York City well, and Miami. Well, I uh, one advantage right now, Miami is beginning to open for business with uh, the physical showing of property and New York is still on shutdown mode. And that's a world of difference at the moment. Um, the way you have to look at the market is, uh, at least right now, is before and after COVID. And what that means, a lot of the contract activity we're seeing now, even um, you know, big sales that are occurring right now in New York, uh, when you read the fine print, the majority of those transactions still have some sort of linkage to pre-COVID. So in a market where brokers can't physically show property, you're not... Uh, you're really, uh, the virtual sort of element like what we're doing now does not make up for the physical showing. So what we are starting to see is an anticipation uh, sort of in the brokerage zeitgeist that we will be open for business towards the end of June or, you know, uh, whenever the governor opens, um, uh, begins phase two of the opening process. And I think we're going to have a tremendous, we're already seeing a tremendous surge in inquiries. Uh, you know, the way you have to really look at what's happening now, and I've, I constantly say this to people I talk to, is that we literally, or we surgically removed the spring market from the calendar, and we're dumping it on top of a later market, whether it's the summer um, or through the fall. So I think what we're going to see right uh, you know in the next couple of weeks is a tremendous surge in actual contract activity that's post covid and a tremendous amount of listings that are going to return to the market one of the characteristics of post versus pre covid has been the collapse of listing inventory uh since the beginning of the year and and that's across i cover th about 35 uh different housing markets around the country for douglas elliman and that condition was universal, almost exclusively, that inventory is expected to expand in the spring, and it, and it didn't. Uh, in fact, uh, after the mid-March, we saw inventory fall, uh, either through withdrawals or uh, people hesitant to list. So as a result, uh, and this is sort of the final point of your question, is we're not seeing price discovery yet in any meaningful way because there really isn't a lot of activity that's post-COVID, uh, but certainly a lot of interest that's developing. Paul, you wanna, you wanna talk about New York City? Sure, I mean, Jonathan's all of his points are 100% right on. Um, what is, you know, it's a different world. And when you can't show real estate, I mean, it's been a long time that the first showing is online, so people are used to that, but it's very hard for somebody to pull a trigger and buy a home uh, that they haven't seen kind of like the dating game, you know, you can get to know each other online, but you need to meet before you get married. And uh, so it's very similar that way. What uh, a saving grace for our industry is that what we do is sell homes and that comes down to shelter. And there are always people who, no matter what's going on in the world, who need to sell, people who need to buy or rent or get wet next time it rains because these are housing decisions. So the discretionary sales are gone. I mean, it's, it isn't a need that's really not happening at the moment. Um, I am amazed at we, in, in, in the last 12 weeks, 13 weeks in, in New York City and at Brown Harris, uh, I've got the stats here. We've uh, had contracts signed during COVID on 110 properties and they range in price from 295,000 to 11 million. Um, 
Uh, those contracts, you know, but before, in March, before COVID, we were very much on a price sensitive, a buyer's market. And uh, people who are signing contracts during this time expect a further discount from there. Also, contracts that were signed before, uh, most of them are, I, I would say, 85% of them are being, uh, were, have been renegotiated. Um, it's usually a seen not as a percentage, but as a contribution to the idea that values may continue to fall, the idea that they don't know when they can close, they don't know when they can renovate, they don't know what the cost of renovation will be. And, but if you translate the ones that, that we have handled, and I've been involved in most of them, you know, five to 7% seems to be the range. The biggest one that I was involved in was about 10% of value. It's often a very specific thing, like, you know, I'm gonna pay your maintenance, and seller will contribute the maintenance for the first year, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of activity. We've also, thankfully, been able to close on, um, how many have we closed? We have closed 150 during these 13 weeks, and that's thank, thankful to renegotiations, holding a deal together, and being able to close virtually. Um, thank you, Edgardo. Um, how do you, how is Miami coping and how do you see the differences today versus March, 2020? Yeah, I, I <clears throat> echo what Jonathan and, and Hal were saying that in many of the transactions that we saw early on after um, March 15th were legacy transactions. That is people that, that were looking at it before and, and really pulled the trigger uh, right after, but in, in Miami, especially on the uh, on the development side of the equation, we are very very used to sell uh, virtually because, um, as you know, the projects in Miami uh, pre-sell 50, 60 percent of the units before even a shovel is put on the ground. So the materials and and all the tools for the brokers to be able to sell where they are present. And uh, so we continue to, uh, to do a lot of work and, and generating a lot of leads uh, virtually. And if, if anything, I think the, the, the leads increase during this time that, of the lockdown because people are, are sitting more at home, the, the brokers and the presentations to brokers, both locally and foreign, including New York, by the way, um, and really multiplied exponentially. People wanted to know what the product available in Miami is. Uh, and transactions uh, had happened. Uh, so uh, Miami really ha was positioned uh, very well even before COVID, uh, especially for the Northeast market, uh, coming to Miami for tax reasons and of course the lifestyle and natural reasons. And I think that it's even more prevalent now. People are, are looking for for properties in Miami. Um, as far as uh, closings is concerned, I mean, really uh, we've done an incredible job at, at closing virtually. The, the building right behind me, the, the Rich Carlton uh, residence in Sunny Isles that I developed, um, got TCO certificate of occupancy uh, the last week of February. Uh, and we had to close 200 units basically um, and many of them by foreign buyers. Uh, and we adapted and we closed them, most of them virtually. We even do walkthroughs virtually, notarizations, financing, everything. And, and really uh, in, in less than two months, we were able to pay the 200 million construction loan and, and we uh, gave the money back to the investors. So it's really been surprisingly good. Of course, the activity uh, has slowed down and the ability for people to travel, it's a huge impact. I mean, even now that Miami is open, uh, yeah, we open the cell centers, but the activity is significantly less, especially from Latin America, because most of the flights are, are not operating yet and people are not able to come even if they want to. So, but we, we, we're positioning ourselves for the future. I, I agree with what Jonathan said that um, those transactions are, are going to come in the near future when things go back to somewhat no, more normal situations. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, David, how, how do you see changes in the past three months since COVID started when it comes to new development, sales, absorption, activity, inquiry, contracts, closings, et cetera? Yeah, so it, it was real tough because we had a great February and first half of March, uh, some of the best months uh, in years, really, at all of our properties in the New York metro area. So, uh, you know, when we, when we got shut down, it was a real shock to the system. We immediately uh, made sure we had everything we could show online. We uh, adapted many more of our units for Matterport tours. Uh, we um, did YouTube. We did videos of vacant units and put them online uh, with YouTube so that we could show, uh, show our product. Um, we've had a couple deals that... Uh, were not pre-COVID that were purely virtual that we've signed, but not many. And um, we've also had uh, things that we had in contract. They are all uh, closing, you know, much of it done virtually. Um, we're allowing people to come in and do their punch list post-closing uh, so that we can get them closed and they can come in when they're allowed to get in there or go in. Um, we've, uh, you know, we, we've adapted. It's, it's, been, it's been a real challenge. It really slowed down a really strong market for us. Um, but we're, we're still moving forward. And we have not had anyone refuse to close. We have not had anyone renegotiate deals other than time. So we've allowed people a month or two delay to when they become comfortable to get in and, and look at uh, the residences. So, um, you know, we're anxious, obviously, to be able to show face to face again. We do have, um, in the metro area, we do have developments in Jersey City and in Hoboken, and they've recently loosened up there. And so there are face to face showings, and we've seen a couple of deals, and we see a lot more traffic. Um, so we're, we're anxious to be able to uh, get, get to face you know, face-to-face -face showings again in New York City. Um, we have like some of the other developers uh, and, and marketing companies offered this satisfaction guarantee where um, if you buy completely virtually, we will, um, uh, you know, make the contract contingent on your being okay with what you see when you eventually do come in. And we've signed a couple of deals with people who are um, out West um, who um, will be coming back east um, in the upcoming weeks. And so as soon as the way that contingencies work, as soon as, they're, as soon as we've opened up and you're allowed to do uh, in-person meetings again, they'll have a short period of time where they have to make a decision. And we're confident with our product and, and with what we have here that people will continue to go forward and those will become non-contingent in the near future. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, 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 I guess there's data out there, Jonathan, there's information there that's public that everybody can buy, right? You can get on the street easy today and, you know, look at transactions that are reported, things that are reported. The, the numbers that we have, and again, it all depends on how you collect data, how subjective it is, what information you use, and how you interpret it as well. But in general, it seems like business has come down dramatically and drastically. If we take this month last year, uh, or even if we compare this month to, or this week, this past week, to the week right before COVID, it seems like the volume of transactions and the, volume, the total volume of sales are hovering around 85 to 90% of what it was. So that's that's a drastic that's a drastic reduction, right? In terms of deal volume, in terms of absorption, um, obviously demand. Um, wh how, where do you see it? How do you analyze numbers like that, and how do you interpret numbers like that in terms of, you know, coming to some type of conclusions or thoughts about recommendations or expectations in the future? Right. So uh, I was having a conversation with a. Uh, owner of a brokerage firm uh, was on a conversation. We were both panelists on a call and 
He owns about 20, I think 20 branches uh, or offices in uh, New Jersey. And they had just opened up New Jersey for showing as uh, I believe uh, David had just mentioned. And, um, and he said, so instead of being 80 or 90% off of a year ago, with the surge in activity, we're off by 50, right? So the context is really important. Um, the, the problem is that, uh, that you know, that while there is data now, um, in many ways, the, and not to cop out on sort of the idea of like, where is the market now? Um, but it's really, uh, we have sort of this layer of uncertainty on top of us, because unlike other tragic of, or significant sort of societal events like 9-11, like Lehman, the financial crisis, this one doesn't have an official sort of moment or end date. It's sort of, you know, we're sort of up in the air. I mean, the Hamptons in Eastern Long Island can show property. New York City can't show property, right? So there's there's all this sort of timing and and therefore pricing is not being sort of fully vetted out in terms of what the impact is. I'm even leery about talking about how much pricing has been impacted because I don't really know. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're sort of, you know, full on, everything is anecdotal. Uh, we, we definitely, you know, the panelists here have shared data and information and that's all legitimate and, and real. Um, but if you look at the context of the overall market, um, we're not quite sure yet where we go because we don't have a good feeling or a solid feeling on how this plays out over the coming three to six months. Nothing matters until the consumer is comfortable with with being out and about. Um, that's the way I would. That's the way I would think of it. So instead of saying, okay, what's happening right now uh, in the context of what it means for the future, it's more of a descriptive of what we're seeing. We're seeing little changes, we're seeing improvement, we're seeing people being definitely interested. I mean, one of the, back to the anecdotal reference, and you know, I have this saying I say all the time is, you know, the plural of anecdotal is not data, um, but that's kind of all we have, or we have a far smaller supply of information. So I look at shared situations like here's New York City can't show property physically, right? There is virtual and there's some traction on the virtual side. But then I look at New Jersey, uh, the state of New Jersey with shelter in place rules being eased and brokers being able to physically show. And then I look at Los Angeles, which I also cover, um, which also released um, uh, bro allowed brokers to be able to physically show property. And in the pending data, whether it's new listing signed or new contracts, there's been a massive surge in activity. But even when you include that surge, we're still way behind where we would have been last year. And that's something that we can't get away from. Um, sure. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's. I want to talk about the markets, you know, the, the markets outside New York City and Miami as well, because I think it has a very strong relationship. But Hall, as far as New York City is concerned, right now, there's obviously concern out there with many buyers in terms of purchasing. Who is purchasing? I mean, there are, there are transactions right now that we're tracking. Those transactions, if you stop categorizing them between co-op and condos, it's mostly co-ops. If you look at price points, it's mainly 80 to 90% in the past eight weeks or 10 weeks below $3 million. Uh, a large percentage of that is below a million dollars. The majority of the deals are between one and 1.5. A lot of it is co-ops, a lot of it is small one bedrooms and studios. Uh, there are legacy contracts, but are there new buyers right now? And who are they signing new contracts? I mean, back to the point that it's a home, it's shelter, and there are people who need it. They've had another baby, they need another bedroom, they sold another place, they're, 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 they need to rent something because their lease is ending. They're moving in from Chicago. I mean, there is always activity and that's why. And uh, it seems to be mostly over $2 million. And um, so it's people with a need. There are some people who are looking at this time as an opportunity to get a better price. 
we have negotiated some deals completely within COVID um, to, to the point about having to see, especially resale apartments. Um, these are people who've seen it before or who know the line. You know, it's the A line at 740 and they know what they, they saw at 9A and this is 10A and so they feel comfortable with the pictures moving forward. But I think it's really the buyers are driven by, that are active today are driven by a need now or a need in the near future. And uh, I do believe that there will be, once we do open up, and that seems to be hopefully be able to show, you know, we don't need to open offices in all honesty. We, we like to, there's energy there. There's a lot of reasons, but we've all learned to work in the virtual space. But the one thing that we absolutely need is to be able to show up. David, once, you're seeing the same thing. In backlog of buyers late decision, sellers who delayed decision that will move forward. David, you're seeing the same thing uh, in your projects as far, as far as new interest right now. Who are the buyers? Yeah, the buyers are the same buyers who we've always had, you know, young uh, couples, uh, young families, some empty nesters. Again, you know, it's people like Hal said, uh, who, are, who need to move for one reason or another. And I, I think, uh, Jonathan was talking about, a little bit about national. So national, you know, we have a, a bigger footprint than, than many, but primarily on the, single on the single family side. While that's a different product than what we're trying to sell here in the metro area, um, you can see that as markets started to open up, buyers are, have been flooding in. And so we had uh, the month of May, the biggest year over year gain since 2004 and i think it was you know there was a pent-up demand people couldn't get out and we're also seeing like with new development uh it's easier to sell at this point because people with occupied homes they either think that uh the pricing isn't good so they're not going to list it or they're afraid to bring strangers into their homes so we've been able to take advantage of that in, in new development and you know in, and in new york and new jersey we've been extolling whatever virtues we have with the product given what the buyer wants today. So we're talking about our bigger units with larger kitchens for, you know, cooking, uh, for, for in, you know, in-home dining, um, units that have multiple bedrooms that can be used as home offices. And some of these bedrooms are on the larger side so they could be actually double home office. So both adults who, who are at home can work there. We have lots of uh, units with outdoor space and you know we're talking about that and we also have buildings that are more boutique and they're not the real massive buildings where you have you know hundreds of neighbors but rather uh, many fewer so that's what we're trying to do we're trying to give people a reason to buy and we hope that they come back and when you know in the next couple of weeks when they can come back in we're hoping to see some deals because we have had a lot of uh, virtual traffic with most of them wanting to come in and see first. And, you know, especially when your studio apartments start at a million dollars, people tend to want to actually get in them and see them. So sure. that'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, soon. Edgardo, do you see, who are your buyers in Miami right now? I, you know, Latin America is, from everything we read, has a lot of issues. And I know that that's a, a major part of your market in Miami. Um, are you seeing still foreign buyers at this point actually pulling the trigger? And are you seeing New Yorkers? Yeah, we, we've seen uh, the New York market, again, even pre-COVID, very uh, active uh, in, in South Florida. And, and even after COVID, uh, the, the amount of single family homes, especially waterfront homes that, that had been moved and hadn't moved before, and now we're moving uh, on the all the way from South Florida. I mean, from from Miami all the way to Palm Beach. And uh, I I hear some uh, of our brokers and some of the competition brokers saying uh, that the demand, especially for uh, for water from homes, both rental and sales, uh, is really very heavy from from the U.S. buyer because it has more mobility today and can come and and see it in some cases they're renting it for six months to test the both the market and the place where they live but but it's certain that that the meaning of home today and where you live took a significant more relevancy than than before of course we all love 
uh, our home, but but being able to to really appreciate the lifestyle and what we have in in South Florida has been um, really highlighted by this crisis. And talking about Latin America, yes, but we have a, a say in Miami that would um, Miami does well when Latin America is in good shape, and Miami does well when Latin America is in bad shape because uh, especially the high net worth individuals <clears throat> are um, diversifying and, and, and buying in Miami and investing in, in, in hard currency like, <clears throat> excuse me, like the dollar and stuff. So um, we're seeing high net worth individuals using their own planes and coming here and, and taking a look at some properties and, and uh, studying the market. Of course, it's, it's harder to pull the trigger and they're all looking for potential opportunities, but we haven't seen uh, even owners or developers reducing prices in any significant way. Yes, uh, we're giving a 30 day due diligence instead of 15 or a, a little bit more time for closing or those type of things. But um, we really feel that uh, the Latin American buyer, uh, it's feeling that things are gonna get worse there before they get better. And in the US, we're in some way in a better shape, both economically and 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 health wise. So they are they are all planning, and a lot of them that even had uh, properties in the market for sale. Some of the listings for the uh, we have from from foreign owners are pulling them out of the market because they're considering coming to Miami for uh, for a period of time of six a month a year until things get better uh, down south. So um, again, I. I might be overly optimistic, but I sense that uh, really the, the desire for, for the lifestyle that we're providing is really hyping here. So the, the issue that I see is, well, what, you know, you all mentioned secondary markets, you all mentioned the national, you know, uh, marketplace and uptick in transactions and activity in New Jersey, in Long Island, in Connecticut, in Westchester, upstate New York, Miami. Um, is there, is there, you know, I think that that's a direct result of obviously what's happening in New York right now, right? COVID-19 is the big concern. Um, is there, do you see a flight out of New York by New York residents who are just afraid to be here? Um, you know, we don't know when a vaccine will be found. It could be this year, it could be next year. Uh, there may be, there may be, they may come up with treatment, they may come up with medicine, but there's obviously concerns, right? And the lifestyle that we sell and sell at a premium in New York City is what people are buying into. This is what they want to experience. Our restaurants, our cafes, our energy on the street, Broadway, New York as we know it, you know, day and night. And this is why they're here. Now, if we can offer that, or we can offer it in a limited way where there may be other opportunities outside New York to enjoy lifestyle in possibly a safer way I see that as a concern for us. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you see a flight out of New York City? How is it gonna affect us in the short term? And what does short term mean for us? How long is short term? And, and what about the concerns of a second, a second wave, uh, possibly this fall? How, how does that put a spin or how does that affect our marketplace? Um, Paul, you wanna, you wanna start with that? Sure, sure. I mean, you know, there, most people, most New Yorkers have some tie to New York. It's either emotional, family, most of it business related. We've certainly seen a huge increase in the number of people who want to have an escape, a weekend home upstate or in the Hamptons. Hamptons is doing very well business-wise. Our Florida offices are doing very well. People want a place to go and spend time. But I see very few people abandoning the city. They, I think we all realize that the issue, at the, first of all, it's a global issue. You can't go anywhere in the world and get away from COVID. It's not a New York issue. It's a, it's a more complicated new, uh, issue in New York because of vertical living. But most people have ties. Most people are looking for something else. We're seeing a lot of that. I have a farm where I am right now upstate and I love it. And the market up here is hot because you're, you're within a few hours of the city and people want to get out in fresh air, et cetera but still maintain their New York home. So I think that's the majority. I think we all realize that what is going on is a result of fear. And the fear is caused by this pandemic. 
I, you know, a vaccine, just, I take a great deal of comfort that this will end. I mean, it, because it's a global issue, I assume every great medical research mind is working on treatments or vaccines. I think treatment makes kind of, in my simple mind, more sense because if we, you know, if we know it's out there and it's, we don't want to get sick, but we know there's an effective treatment for, that would work for most people if you're not very old or com compromised in some other way, the fear starts to go away. And um, so, and that will happen. I mean, I don't know of a virus that hasn't, maybe some of them haven't been cured like AIDS, but they've been treated, treatable. And that removes most of the fear. And then we can come back globally. But I think New York will have greater activity once that happens. And as I said, if every great mind in the world is working on it, I think it's gonna happen in the near future. I certainly hope so. So, so that I guess I, I guess that that's that's the hope, and that's you know we're all trying to be optimistic about you know a solution to COVID nineteen happening soon, so we can all get back to our lives and businesses can you know function. Um, the the issue possibly is time. Three months is one thing, and coming back in September, great. Will schools open up in September? If they don't, how would parents get back to to work? Um, if this, if there is a second wave and there's just not an understanding right now in the next three months about when life can start, I guess there will be an effect on real estate because developers Absolutely. can't wait. There, there's loans out there. There's debt that needs to be serviced. Um, you know, there, there might be an effect or there probably will be an effect on value. How do you, Jonathan, when you look at four months ago, right? If we look at February 2020, arguably, because, you know, we've seen all the articles and we've seen the numbers. For the past 18 months, things have been lingering. The market was not absorbing well. Uh, prices were possibly too high. There was capital on the street. We have buyers with money, but they were not purchasing. And we saw in some projects for the past 18 months, new development projects, absorption of maybe one to two units a month, where in healthy conditions, you might see five to 10 or 10 to 15. Now, theoretically, if value was over, if, if properties were overvalued three months ago, four months ago, um, you know, by whatever percentage that we want to put on it, right? Where, where are the expectations for post COVID values? Do you see values going down even further. And we have different classes of real estate, obviously. We have condos, yeah. we have resales, we have co-ops, we have brownstones. I'm talking about residential real estate. And we have new developments. How do you see value going forward? And I know it's a, it's a matter of time. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of time. And I know it's impossible to put a number on things, but from your perspective, as somebody who lives the numbers on a daily basis, how do you see it? Well, uh, one of the characteristics of the 35 or so housing markets I covered across the country uh, in the first quarter, um, actually, there was a noticeable uptick in both pricing trends and sales trends, including Manhattan. If you look at the New York City and specifically the Manhattan market, there actually was an uptick in sales activity, but prices were continuing to slide. Um, and so the way that I'm, I looked at going into COVID is we had this, uh, if you were a strong market, like you know in California, uh, it was stronger. If you were a weak market, it was less weak. So there was an upward momentum, even though markets like New York still had challenges or, or problems with pricing. And so we went into this and the way we come out of it, I don't think any of that changes that you know, there's still going to be a challenge um, at the high end in New York because of the mansion tax and the added transfer tax uh, north of $2 million. We've, we've already seen, we already saw that in the fourth quarter and the first quarter. That's still there. Uh, salt is still there. You know, when the COVID passes, Florida still has the salt advantage, so to speak. Um, so there's a lot of things that will probably stay the same. I think what's really the focus on looking at where we're going and, and you know, the probability of, uh, you know, weaker pricing 
is, uh, has a lot to do with what's happening in other sectors like the commercial market, where I think right now you have millions of people in Manhattan that are working from home and it kind of works. Uh, it doesn't mean that people don't want to go back to the office or, but there's going to be some sort of, I think there's going to be a fairly significant change. And what that means is that, you know, we could very easily see New York now, New York, the city competing much more with the suburban markets and the second home markets than ever before. Although, um, and we're already seeing a surge in inquiries in second home markets, as Hall was saying, you know, in where he is, there's an, a, an uptick in activity. We're already seeing that uh, activity occur outside of the city. Um, and we may even see the, the way we view real estate may change. Like for example, instead of having a primary and a secondary re uh, residence, we end up having co-primary where you maybe don't trade up to the big property in the city as your former primary, and maybe you focus um, or spend more on a second home market or consider a second home market, a second home, because you haven't, you know, uh, you haven't considered that before and you want the option of living in, you know, the two different places and they both kind of work. So when we sit there and say, how is this going to affect pricing in the city? Um, we don't even know uh, how, you know, housing is going to be handled, how the consumer is going to um, uh, view housing, um, you know, for the next two, three years, you know, and, and I agree that when there is, you know, if there is a vaccine, and I hope there's a vaccine, um, you know, that outbound migration uh, will temper. After 9-11, same thing happened. It's not the same thing, but uh, we did see two to three years of outbound migration, and then it stopped and it reversed. Uh, so I'm not sold on sort of a long-term structural uh, with the perhaps this idea that uh, second homes will end up being a bigger market than they were pre-COVID. Yeah, so, you know, there's COVID-19, which ob obviously to me right now, that is the main issue in terms of people uh, feeling more comfortable about coming back, number one, and, 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 and going into the market again. But there is a financial crisis all around us. It's yes. global, it's national, it's local. I mean, there's a financial meltdown. Wall Street might be doing great, but we just entered recession officially. Uh, we know about unemployment numbers. We know about the percentage of businesses that will not come back. And while, you know, there may be 40 million unemployed right now, and some of them will come back when things get better, many of them will not. Right. Um, there's all kind of stuff going on around us in terms of New York City. And we can talk about Miami in a second, like, you know, the city government, like laws that were passed recently in terms of taxes. What about real estate taxes? Right. Um, they're going to go up. David is a developer. Um, first of all, how do you see the new development inventory, um, you know, pipeline in the next couple of years? Um, and then with for developers who do have projects today, some of them at twenty percent sellout, some of them at forty percent or fifty percent sellout, some of them with one, some of them with five or six. What do developers do if if the absorption is not there necessarily? Um, what do you do with the projects? What's plan B? Uh, if you could just talk about the, the pipeline in general for the next couple of years and just the inventory landscape and new development and landscape and then just address what a developer may do uh, as plan B until things do get better and thing absor until absorption picks up. Yeah, so, I mean, clearly, you know, we got to the point where supply was outstripping demand um, by pretty big numbers. I don't know if Jonathan or others have reported that, you know, it could be four or five years of inventory and new development. I think that that's accurate. And, you know, I think it's in certain price points, um, certain unit types. I would say there's a glut of two bedrooms. Uh, there's fewer, you know, smaller and bigger units that uh, people need to move. Um, I think the pipeline is going to slow down, obviously, and it had been slowing down a bit. I think you're going to continue to see that, especially with COVID. Um, we, we went for um, 
nearly five years without buying uh, a new site. And we closed on something at the, uh, towards the end of last year um, at 103rd and Broadway, which we're excited. Um, and we've talked to you, <laughs> Shlomi, about. Um, and uh, so we feel good about it. If it's, if it's a project that's not tremendously large and one where we're not trying to get 3,000 a foot or something like that, we think there's still a market for it. But you're going to have to execute really well. It's got to be the, the exact right uh, target for the market with finishes, with amenities. Um, and we, we're all, we all have a chance to uh, reevaluate things now in how we want to design and sell uh, units. And I think there's going to, people are going to adapt to that. So, and they may take time and they may redesign. So it's, uh, there's going to be a delay in new product coming to the market and it'll give chance for further absorption of, of what's out there. Um, we're fortunately in a place with everything we have where we're not under any great pressure to sell. Uh, we don't have banks breathing down our necks. Um, although the banks have been more for, uh, uh, forgiving, they've been extending loans. Um, so I can't speak for other developers. I can say that we're gonna, we're gonna you know, get through this. Um, other ones are gonna have to determine what, what makes most sense for them and their, their financial partners. Um, but this, if there's anything good in COVID is that it will slow down the pipeline and it will give chance uh, for product to be absorbed. You know, when you look at uh, the, the last financial crisis, 2008, 2009, that was such a big shock and there was no money available to do new products. So pretty much everything shut down and things got absorbed a lot faster than we thought that they would. And it was largely because the pipeline got shut. While we've been, you know, in a situation with greater supply than demand for the last, you know, since probably 2015, um, people kept building. And, and some people kept building really pretty big projects, which surprised me. So it kept adding to the inventory. This is going to kind of slow down the pipeline and, and we'll, well, you know, look to, look to see what happens, happens with absorption numbers. Um, but sure. So we have 10 minutes before we're going to take questions. I want to cover a few more things. Edgardo, uh, as far as Miami is concerned, just to follow up on this question, do you see an issue with inventory versus supply in Miami when it comes to new development? And again, what plans does a developer have uh, for large buildings that are currently sitting and possibly where the inventory absorption is low? Well, the, the pipeline in Miami uh, has slowed down significantly if way before this. And uh, we in Miami, uh, starting in 2010, 11, every developer in town and, and some other towners launched projects. And we had a very significant increase on, on new development in Miami uh, that lasted um, until 17, 18, uh, as far as new projects being launched. But since then, uh, it really significantly slowed down. And, and most projects that that are under construction in Miami uh, got pre-sold, as I said, 50, 60, 70% before even construction starts. So those projects are, are being completed or just completed. And in our case, we had three major developments, the Ritz-Carlton behind me, the J Signature, which is also a 60-story tower on the beach, and now Virgin Fort Lauderdale. All of them completed, all of them with very uh, small inventories left uh, to sell. And, and, and all the projects that we represent, uh, with the exception of, of very few that are um, just in the beginning of construction, they are all uh, really very far advanced and or completed. So and, uh, I think that now the developers, including uh, some New York developers, are looking for, for sites because uh, at, at this time, if you wanted to buy something that is going to be delivered uh, in, in 2023, 2024, 2025, it's very difficult to find. There is really nothing new that it's being offered in the market pre-construction because the, the absorption wasn't there. I mean, there wasn't a possibility of selling or pre-selling 50% with big deposits before uh, you could put a shovel in the ground. I think that the expectation is that that, that that demand is going to come back and 
uh, and their new projects are going to be launched. But there is no the the perception that there's a lot of inventory from developers is is not a the right perception here in South Florida. Cool. Um, it sounds like I should open up an office in Miami. Go yeah, on. I mean, I, I've been telling you that you should come and help me sell some of the projects here. But I mean, you you resisted. No, I mean, I think you guys were very, very, I mean, obviously, uh, the, you now complain, quote unquote, about the price drops. But the, the New York market has um, had recent prices for, for decades. I mean, the demand was incredible and prices were awesome. And now you're seeing some some more adjustments and the higher price inventory was hard to sell, but, and it's obviously requires an adjustment, but also think that, that people have very short memories or short term memories. When, when things get back to normal, uh, people are going to love uh, the urban living that New York offers and New York is going to continue to be New York. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about short term and long term. So I remember I was here September 11th and I was here in 2008 and I was here for two other cycles before that. Um, and many of you, all of you, I think, were as well. And I remember after September 11th events and after the 2008 financial crisis, New York City real estate, you know, came back fairly quickly. Um, in the last one in 2008, and, and Hall and I lived through that together, and I still have the scars to show for it. <laughs> but you could see improvement in the market by 2010, 2011. Now, we, we have COVID-19 and we have everything around us that's happening and taking into consideration some of what the government is doing in terms of initiatives, the PPP, the liquidity pump, um, but also taking into consideration what New York City is going through right now in terms of city leadership possible, in terms of taxes, um, in terms of stuff we haven't discussed like retail, like commercial, uh, the hospitality business that, you know, that gets affected in, in a very strong way. Um, what do you think about the time frame? Do you think this will be the same or this will be more drawn out? And let's, let's answer that and then we'll go into questions. I'll love to start with Jonathan. Well, uh, in both of the, the, the two uh, prior events that I had discussed earlier with Lehman and 9-11, um, right after 9-11, uh, uh, there were I, the five weeks after the event, there was a five way bidding war on a one bedroom apartment in a non down door, non doorman building in the East fifties. Um, there was this sudden sort of snapback um, uh, after Lehman really the, by 2010, which is, you know, five quarters, uh, we really started to see a rebound in activity. The federal government had done, you know, uh, first time buyer tax credits, and there were all sorts of incentives. This go round, um, it, it, and we always say it feels different, or this time it's different. Um, I think I'm less worried about uh, the future of New York than I was after Lehman and 9 11. Um, but I do think, and I do think we'll have sort of a short term in the context of over the next two, three months, this release of pent up demand, which we're already seeing from no spring market. But I do think, uh, you know, when you look at the unemployment, you were, you know, you had referenced, you know, this meltdown or, you know, significant uh, employment challenges. When you look at actually who was lost their jobs, where the job loss was in the context of sort of Manhattan real estate, um, it, it was skewed heavily towards hourly wage earners, the gig economy, um, independent contractors, and not mid-tier salary workers, even though they certainly were impacted. I'm not downplaying that, but there was a tremendous, there has been a tremendous skew. And so that's why I think in the context of Manhattan real estate, um, I think it does feel a little different um, than maybe the economic data might suggest. I'm not being Pollyanna, but I'm just, you know, I'm looking over the next three, four months. The other thing, and to Edgardo's point, is that human beings have an infinite capacity to forget the immediate past. Uh, we've seen that in lots of, you know, historical significant societal uh, events um, that have happened over the last 30 years in the New York market. Superstorm Sandy, all sorts of uh, the flash crash, all sorts of things, uh, lesser in scale maybe to the other events. 
Um, so I look at this as two to three years out. Um, and this is also predicated on a vaccine and that at least the, the second wave of the virus that is already happening in other parts of the country and the world is not nearly as impactful to New York because of you know the, the much more extensive shelter in place rules that we've you know we've been uh, sort of living through. So I look at this short term uh, uh, snapback, um, but but doesn't bring us to parity with pre COVID. I think that's uh, sort of more gradual over the next two to three years. David. Yeah, you know, New York came back faster than any of our markets, uh, Toll Brothers markets in the country um, after, uh, after Lehman. And we're resilient here. I think, I think it's going to happen again. Like Jonathan said, you know, we were at the front end of this. We got hit really hard, but there's 19 states now who have uh, cases increasing. There are people that didn't do what we did and weren't as smart as we were. So they're going to certainly be impacted. Um, and I think beyond cultural reasons for people to come to places like New York are the economic ones. And we have a really diverse economy here and, and we're going to continue to, to draw people. The interesting thing will be to see how many, how, how long term is the work from home thing embraced? Because I, my sense is that People want to get back to the office, and they're going to they're going to continue to do so as as we figure out the best ways to deal with with the virus, and as we get closer to a vaccine and something like that. And uh, so I, I'm pretty bullish on on our mid and and long term range for uh, for New York City. Ed Carter, you want to talk about Miami and uh, the cycle right now? We have two minutes and then we'll go, and I want to hear from Hall as well, and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, I, I really echo what David and Jonathan were saying, and, and, and I agree with Hall that uh, the, if we can find a treatment that people feel comfortable with, that even if they get it, um, chances are they're not going to end up in a, in a ventilator. I think that, that things are going to go back to, to more normalcy and and I am a firm believer that that certainly uh, real estate, especially residential real estate, is very um, very well positioned to to take advantage of of this type of things. How what happened to to retail and and the behavior of offices? Mm -hmm. I, again, I think that collaboration and and working together and 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 seeing each other face to face and 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 really networking in the same office is is very very important and at least. The, the the culture in our company is a we're really a family and we're we love to help each other and work together and even though we've been able to accomplish it uh, virtually to some extent it's it's not the same and, and we're all really very motivated to to get back to to create a uh, new things and to create new buildings but together all you know uh, i believe that we're going to see Long term, I'm very optimistic because I think there will be a medical solution. I think New York has a magic. I think we're resilient. I think it will. Short term, until there is a medical solution, I think the, the effect on pricing, on values is going to continue. And I think that it's going to, people are going to have to be a lot more negotiable to be able to sell properties. Remember also, there's a lot more going on. I mean, COVID is the big issue, but we have the tax law changes that affect our market. Uh, uncertainty is, is an enemy of residential real estate sales. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. In every presidential election, I bet Jonathan probably has a study that says this, you know, the market in the spring starts to slow down because uncertainty. Um, today's election year, no matter what side of the fence you're on, you think it's the end of the world if the other person doesn't get in. So I think there are people holding back for that. But long term, get through the election, get, a, get, get on top of this issue more medically. Uh, I'm very optimistic. In the meantime, it's going to be a tough road. Okay, cool. Well, thank you all. I have a lot of questions. I mean, our audience has been very, very active. I'm not going to be able to get through all these questions, but there is a thread here that is continuous with a lot of uh, the people in our audience. And that is, I'm going to try and summarize it because it comes in different forms from different people, but 
there is obviously the U.S. is going to have a huge deficit. New York City already we know has huge deficit. Where is all this money coming from, if not from higher income taxes and real estate taxes? Now that. I believe, and a lot of people here believe the same way, will be the concern in the future because we're now possibly going into a marketplace in New York with less affluent people after COVID-19 and after the debacle that we're experiencing now globally. Uh, people that can possibly afford less because their salaries may have been cut or maybe they lost one income in a family um, uh, in a household. Uh, how is this going to affect New York City. Um, uh, do, do you expect that taxes will go higher? And what about real estate taxes? What about developers that own retail? What about all these commercial buildings? What about all these landlords? Um, obviously, that's a trickle down effect, right? We're talking about brokers, we're talking about owners, we're talking about um, uh, management companies. Everybody gets affected by it. So, possibly, do you see because of that, can you comment on less demand? and less financial capability uh, and higher burden of taxes and what's the effect looking like in New York? Jonathan? Uh, yeah, uh, over 50% of tax revenue in New York City comes from real estate. And uh, so uh, I would assume that at least in the current political zeitgeist, that the shortfalls will be pointed towards the wealthier uh, demographic of the city. I don't. I don't think there's any uh, lack of clarity in in that sort of direction at that moment. Um, and so, when you look at uh, and you look at the taxes in the surrounding, you know, suburbs of New Jersey, of Westchester, of Nassau, they're all among the highest in the nation, right? And so, to me, the 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 way this will play out is at least initially is is going to come out with uh and we saw this with the implementation of the mansion tax uh is uh lower pricing you know that that uh this is a a, a heavy weight on property values and i think that's the that's the only way it plays out at least in the over the next you know several years unless something changes dramatically um, i think it's as simple as that uh, David, you are you own buildings. You have heavy investments in New York and otherwise. Any comments on this concern? No, I don't think differently than than what Jonathan is saying. Although I do, you know, New York City is the economic engine of the country, and I think that there's gonna there's gonna have to be some reckoning with that at the federal mm -hmm. level, and I'm hoping that we will get uh, the assistance that we need. Um, we deserve it. Okay, Paul. Yeah, I I agree with David. I agree with Jonathan. Um, you know, I think, uh, and also again, the problem may be more acute in New York at the moment, but the problem's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't escape this. There are other communities that are going to have trouble too. So we're going to have to come out of it together. I do think again, it's going to put a lot of pressure on price. Edgardo, any um, any input into that? No, I, I I think that they're all right. I mean, they obviously the the cities have a, and municipalities have suffered significant expenses and and losses during this. So uh, I think the federal government is going to have to figure out a way to to support those uh, municipalities and cities and states in order to to be able to come out of this without taxing. Uh, significantly the business because it's the engine that that's going to continue to move the country so uh, it's a uh, uh, it's difficult in an election year and, and we'll have to figure out how to do it and depending on who is elected i guess they have different ways but um but they will have to to come up with a solution for this because uh, creating additional taxes and 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 more burden on people that are already having problems is not going to be a solution Sure. I have another question, and I'd like to uh, ask David that question, and you know anybody else would you know I'd love for you to chime in as well. So, David, land prices remain high, have remained high in the city for a very long time. Uh, very few viable deals um, that we've seen in like the past few years. Um, do you see a change in that in terms of 
because of the effects of supply and demand, because of what we're experiencing now, do you see a change in land prices in the city? And if so, how would that possibly affect uh, the pipeline of projects or projects that have signed up just in the past two, three years that naturally have much higher performers than what might be developed at much lower prices and therefore um, lower prices for sellouts? Yeah, so, I mean, land prices have been slowly coming down since, right. since their peak. And I think you're going to continue to see that happen uh, with COVID. And, um, but you're also going to per perhaps have sellers who are, or if they're not pressured to sell, they're just not going to because they don't see this as, a, as the best time to be selling. So I think you're not going to see a lot of trading for uh, a period of time. And then as people start to get more confident in the economy and in the real estate market in New York City, buyers are going to come back and start, uh, start acquiring again. And, you know, it, it, it's the same for anyone. You know, you buy, if you buy at the peak and prices go down, you're not in great shape. You make less money than you thought you were going to make. You adjust, you do what you have to do with regard to, to pricing. So I don't see that as being any different than any other, you know, cycle and, and when you buy, uh, when you buy land and when you're selling units. Okay. I'd like to ask uh, Hall and uh, Edgardo a question. This is, um, as, as, as an owner and the president of two major companies uh, with hundreds of agents, um, how do you cope in a situation like this? I mean, income is down, revenue is down, commissions are down uh, significantly. I don't know what things are going, uh, going to come back to. I don't know if anybody does. If, if, if theoretically we're at 70 to 80, 90% down right now, and things may come back to 50%, how does a company, how does a brokerage deal with this? You have fixed costs, you have hundreds of employees. Um, how do you adjust and, and for how long? And that's on a macro level. And what happens with the brokerage community? As it is, it's been very challenging and very competitive for brokers. There's always a percentage of brokers that make money, but the majority of brokers have been challenged and for a very long time. Um, how do they cope with this? If, if transactions are lower, if we have you know, less to go around, this, how, do, how do you cope with it as an owner of a company and, and as a president of a company? Hall, maybe um, we can start with you. Sure. I mean, you know, companies have to look at expenses and cut where they can. But with keeping the eye on support, we need to keep supporting the brokers in education and, and psychologically in every way. During the 13 weeks, we spent a lot of time communicating with the brokers and providing a service that way. And, uh, and, and we, it's all a relationship business. I do think that the pressures on brokers have been tremendous for a while. This is another time. I think the ranks will get thinner. And, um, but, you know, brokers also need to adapt. And, you know, many brokers are sort of even successful ones, a little pigeonhole. I sell these kind of properties. I rent those kind of properties. And I think I'm seeing a lot of brokers being terrific and adapting and moving where there is any activity. I think a lot of brokers have spent this, the smart ones have spent this uh, last 13 weeks on building relationships and strengthening the relationships they have because it is totally a relationship business and keeping their buyers informed, their sellers informed in an intelligent way, being supportive, just as the companies are trying to be uh, supportive of the, of the agents. So you just do what you can and you do make certain cuts, you know, that you, as, as, as one can, but again, without sacrificing support. Support's the big thing. Eduardo? Yeah, I absolutely agree with it. I mean, like in any crisis, uh, you always see attrition of brokers because um, some of the brokers that are not very productive and that they're only very good when, when the market is, it sells itself. Uh, obviously, when crisis happens, they, they usually um, disappear from this market and, and it's sort of a shift to quality and those that did well before that do even better then. But we are really looking at uh, the, the brokerage business has gotten very, very thin because of the, 
the split and commissions uh, with the good agents and, and all the expenses and, and fancy offices. So we are looking at all the expenses, in some cases, consolidating offices that uh, happen to be close by and people are really a lot more comfortable now working significantly from home and, and are really actually volunteering to say, we don't need a, an office three blocks away from, from the next one. Let's all consolidate in one and, and, and pull all together. So I've, I've seen some, some signs of, of people really pulling together. Same thing with, um, with the staff personnel coming to me and saying, don't, let's not cut people, let's reduce everybody's salary a certain percentage, but let's stay together uh, and see how we can cope with this. And, and so there's some good signs about that too, but, uh, but we need to be very careful on, on the expenses and the fancy offices and, and the type of things that we were doing before and now need to be really considered very carefully. Okay, we have uh, 45 seconds left. I know some of us have to uh, cut off at exactly 11.15. So I'll conclude this webinar. I just wanted to uh, thank my panelists very much. Paul, Jonathan, David, and Eduardo, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I admire all of you, uh, your true leaders in your industries, and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your insight with us. And to the audience as well, thank you so much for chiming in and for listening. Um, we are all available for answers or for comments. Uh, thank you all and be careful and good luck. Thank you, Shlomi. Thank you, Shlomi. Great Thanks, job, everybody. Thank you very thank much. You.